take some time to discuss with my Raising Monarch viewers a difficult but very important subject. The question of whether or not we should euthanize adult monarchs we've reared that turn out to be infested with OE spores. If you're unfamiliar with what OE is, it's a parasite, and down in the description below I've got links to some videos I've already made. Some of the videos show you what OE is, and then also how to test for it with your adult monarchs. In those videos, a couple different times I mention what you should do if you do have a confirmed case of an adult having OE parasite spores, and that is to euthanize them. The idea being that if it's a carrier of this parasite, which can be fatal, that it will actually do more harm to the population that we're trying to help. Since the time of posting those videos, I have been questioned as to whether or not euthanizing these adult carriers is always the right choice, is it always necessary, and in some cases, is it the wrong choice? I want to make it clear that I don't mind being questioned about this at all. In fact, anybody who knows me knows that a principle that I hold very dear is that no claim is immune to questioning. No claim should be taken upon just authority itself. While there are certainly times where we have authorities we want to go to and trust for their information, at the same time, those authorities should always be providing evidence. And the amount and strength of that evidence needs to be at the same level of what the claim is. Something else to be very clear about, I want you to know, I am not an authority. As I've said many times, I'm just a guy trying to help out the monarchs. So when this question was brought to my attention, I did what I think is one of the healthiest aspects of science. I questioned myself. Why was it that I was saying that we should be euthanizing these adults? Where did that information come from? What was my source? For much of the information that I've trusted over the years, I go to monarchwatch.org. In their Monarch Biology page, they have a subsection on parasite control. On that page, they discuss what OE is, what the symptoms are, and what some steps are that you can do to prevent it. And on that page, they also make it quite clear how they feel infected butterflies should all be killed. Now, at the time of making those videos, that was enough for me. But it's always a good idea to cross-reference, and since this was brought to my attention, I wanted to find out what are some other sources saying. For the last four months, I've done what I could to find out what other various experts in the field of monarch ecology recommend in situations like this. In some cases, I've reached out to these experts, and in other cases, they were put into contact with me. One such authority on OE parasites is Dr. Sonia Altizer, an athletic association professor of ecology out of the University of Georgia. She's been studying specifically the OE parasite for roughly 20 years, and she definitely knows her stuff. Through an email conversation, she stated that if you find adults that are infected with OE, and this is due to human intervention, human activity, so through your rearing process, that yes, those monarchs should be euthanized. However, if you have a monarch that turns out to be infested with OE, and it's most likely that this was an infection caused by natural reasons, let's say you brought in a caterpillar, not an egg, but a caterpillar from the wild, and this was the one that turned out to be infected, most likely then that caterpillar's infection was caused by natural circumstances while out in the field. In such cases, she prefers that this kind of specimen still be released. In the same email, though, she also stated that this is her personal view and that there are no strict guidelines on the matter. Dr. Altizer is part of the Monarch Health Project, and on their website, monarchparasites.org, they have multiple pages that discuss the details of the OE parasite. Things like the parasite's life cycle, how to prevent for them, and how to test adults for spores. In their Frequently Asked Questions section, regarding monarchs that are infected, Dr. Altizer's recommendation is there, though worded just a little bit differently. According to monarchparasites.org, if an adult monarch is infected, yet is still able to fly, then it can be released. So what's some of the reasoning behind this recommendation, and why is it different than that of monarchwatch.org? Well, some of the research that the University of Georgia does concerning monarchs and OE parasites takes place in South Florida. In South Florida, the milkweed is there year-round, and so the OE parasite and its spores are also there year-round. They never get like a winter purge like we do here in Michigan. And also, there's a population of monarchs that are there year-round. In such an environment, the OE parasites can build up to a large population. They're very prevalent. What some of their work examines is if the monarch population in that area has been able to adapt to the OE and build up a resistance to it. And if such a thing is happening, then the logic behind this is that a monarch that is infected, but also has survived to adulthood, may have some of that genetic resistance, and thus would be genetically valuable to the rest of the population. We wouldn't want to eliminate it from the gene pool. Now, keeping all that in mind, another area that's being researched in the South Florida region deals with the exotic tropical milkweed plant, Asclepius carasavica. 
and what, if any, effects that has on monarch caterpillars that use that as their primary diet, and how OE develops within such monarchs. The evidence in this area is a bit more developed, and it does seem to be that monarch caterpillars that dine primarily on this species of milkweed are able to resist OE a little bit better than others. That because of just the mix of chemicals that are in this species of milkweed plant, monarch caterpillars that are eating it are able to acquire that resistance. A resistance that isn't passed on from the parent to the offspring, but instead a resistance that is there because of the environment you developed in. And this brings to light the idea that a type of behavioral resistance might be a possibility. It could be that one way that the monarch butterfly is adapting to OE parasites is if females are having a behavioral choice of selecting the tropical milkweed plant instead of other species if the plants are nearby each other and she's given the choice. This would also count as a type of resistance, but it would be due to a behavioral choice, which also then could be tied to genetics in some way. That the instinct to choose tropical milkweed over other plants could be something that's linked to the genes, and thus valuable in the gene pool. And quite recently, there are studies that have been done that are showing this behavioral resistance is a likelihood. So if you do have a monarch from this area that's infested, that maybe has this resistance, perhaps it should be released. Or perhaps not. Another expert in this field who studies this, Dr. Mark D. Hunter out of the University of Michigan, through email, he offered his take on this. Dr. Hunter is a co-author of the paper, Transgenerational Parasite Protection Associated with Paternal Diet. This specific study and others that he's been involved with have taken a very close examination as to what the effects are for monarch populations that are primarily eating tropical milkweed plants and also what effect that's had on OE strains. Just like most parasites, OE has different strains. Some can be more debilitating than others. What Dr. Hunter relayed to me was this. If you are rearing a dozen or so monarchs for personal interest that you then release into the wild, it's okay to release a few with OE. Unless, all caps, you reared them on the exotic tropical milkweed. In that particular case, we suspect you can select for OE with higher virulence, and we would recommend killing the infected butterflies. So according to Dr. Hunter in the findings of his research, in areas where tropical milkweed is the primary diet of the monarch caterpillar, and those monarchs have a resistance to OE, the OE strains in that area are more likely to be more potent, more virulent. While tropical milkweed can make these monarchs more resistant to the OE strains and stronger, well, also, it's like an arms race, and the OE strains have also become stronger. And thus, according to Dr. Hunter, it's even more important that such infected individuals are not released back into the wild, as they could be spreading an even more potent strain of OE. So with all that being brought to light to me, I decided to go back to Monarch Watch and see what they had to say on this. Well, I was able to set up a bit of a Q&A with the director of monarchwatch.org, Dr. Chip Taylor, who was an excellent gentleman, very generous with his time and his information. What follows is the Skype conversation that we had. Thank you, Dr. Chip Taylor, for, uh, for being with us today. And if you could, just for those watching, introduce yourself and what your credentials are and Monarch experience. I'm Chip Taylor. I'm director of Monarch Watch here at the University of Kansas. I've been a long-term faculty member here, now now retired, but still actively running Monarch Watch and doing an awful lot of uh, traveling on behalf of monarchs. Uh, Monarch Watch started out as a, uh, an educational organization primarily, and then we shifted a little bit to research, but we're, we're still doing research, And but now most of the work that we do focuses on monarch conservation. What we wanted to ask you about... Um Concerning the OE infections that sometimes monarchs experience, what's your opinion as to what should be done with any adults that are found to be infected, whether they should be released or they should be euthanized? Well, the, the issue with the adults is I prefer to call them infested. The adults are covered with spores, and they disseminate these spores when they touch something. So if the adults are in contact with other adults, you have a horizontal transfer, which means a transfer from one adult to another. So in a cluster, um, butterflies that are infested with spores can transfer those spores to other butterflies. Um, butterflies that are also infested with spores, uh, males, for example, can transfer spores to females in the process of mating. So that's another means of just, uh, spreading this disease. Um, 
But females are primarily the source of the spores. They have a lot of spores on their abdomen, and as they proceed to move around from place to place to lay eggs, they disseminate these spores on the leaf surface uh, that they're laying an egg on, as well as on the eggs themselves. The process there then is that the larva eats its way out of the eggshell, um, consumes a few spores, maybe eats the leaf, consumes a few more spores, and becomes in infected in this case, rather than infested. All right, the question is, what should we do about butterflies that are infested with spores? Well, you have all of these modes of transmission, all of these ways in which spores are transferred horizontally and vertically uh, through the system. That spreads the infestation. That spreads the infection. That spreads the disease, and that increases the mortality rate associated with the disease. Do we want that? I don't think so. My preference then would be to euthanize those butterflies, even those that have a relatively small number of spores. So there have been um, some questions about uh, recent research showing the medical value of tropical milkweed. And some have, um, have even found that it has medicinal properties when it comes to monarchs infected with spores. If a monarch is coming from, for example, a South Florida population, would your recommendation still be, even if it's infected, to euthanize? Um, and I, I bring up the question because some have concern that it could have a, a type of resistance to um, OE because it's been around as much OE as it has, as much exposure as it has. And that if it was able to survive to adulthood with the with the spores, that it might have genetic value to the rest of the population. Do you have a, an opinion on that? Well, there are two issues in the question that you brought up. One is uh, the, the nature of the plants that they feed on and whether those chemicals in those plants actually have a negative effect on the development of the spores. But the point here is that you have a plant interaction that determines uh, the dose response uh, curve in this situation. Um, in other words, the suits that you give monarch larva uh, and the ultimate effect is uh, there's an interaction with the plant, uh, for better or worse. Now, the question then is, is there any resistance uh, given that scenario? And here's the problem with that. Here's the idea, here's the problem with the idea of resistance that everything that's indicated in the data is that all of the susceptibility to OE is dose related. That is, it is dependent upon the number of spores consumed by the caterpillar. Um, so if you consume, say, 20 or 100 spores or something like that as a caterpillar, uh, you're in pretty bad trouble. Uh, you're, you're, you, it, and the, the more that you consume, the worse off the probability is of your surviving to the adult stage and so on and so forth. You, you just don't see any evidence for resistance here. And the probability of evidence um, for resistance is, is going to be really hard to come by given this uh, dose-related uh, response of these caterpillars and this sporulation um, in the system. Um, you know, if it's totally related to dose response, how are you going to get to uh, resistance? If you have some resistance to uh, 10 spores, that's pretty good. Maybe you can select for that. But this, the progeny of that particular butterfly that's resistant to 10 spores, once subjected to 100 spores, uh, probably has no chance at all. So to your knowledge, um, has there been an attempt to study and find if there is resistance is there any evidence of any monarch populations having resistance to OE? There's no evidence that I'm aware of any monarch population showing resistance or of anybody looking specifically for resistance of monarch butterflies to OE. What there appears to be through uh, Sonia Altheiser's work is a little bit of, of information suggesting that OE that originates from different populations is slightly different. Now, that could suggest that uh, there might be some differences among the OE varieties that 
is related to, uh, say, attenuation of its virulence in order to maintain itself. But I don't know that that uh, is there's any clear evidence that that's the case at this time. If that were true, just you know, speculating, would it also be possible that the OE in that area might have a higher virulence, and that might be more reason to not let that OE spread? Could be. In other words, it could go both ways. Well, um, I guess the last question I've got for you since we have you here is just um, any message that you'd want to give to those who are raising monarchs, is there something that you definitely hope that they know that they are doing in their process or anything that you really hope they aren't doing? <laughs> It'd be better not to release anything that has OE on it. Um, um, OE spores on the adult butterfly. But if you're breeding them for multiple generations, as we do, we have a monarch cultures that we maintain on a year-round basis, and there are lots of breeders that do, you have to check every single adult that you use in a breeding program for OE. And if you don't, you, your whole program is going to crash. I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, one badly infested butterfly getting in a cage, in a mating cage, is going to take you down. So you really have to check for OE if you're going to be a continuous breeder. Please do that. We need everybody to do that. Um, there is no reason not to do that. It's pretty simple. Uh, if everybody did that, uh, we would be much better off. All right. Well, Dr. Chip Taylor, I can't thank you enough for your time. Really appreciate getting a a much more expert opinion on this. All right. Well, glad to help you, Richard. Um, good luck with your uh, your editing on this. My answers are pretty long-winded, but uh, have fun with it and uh, uh, get the word out there. All right. And plant, and plant milkweed. All right? That's what we got to do. We and plant, plant milkweed. milkweed. I, I totally agree. <laughs> All right. See you, doctor. All right. Bye. Okay. So what are the takeaways from all of this? Let's start with what all seem to agree upon. One of the best ways to not even have to deal with this euthanization question is to make sure that you are sanitizing your equipment often. Down in the description, I also have a video on OE that shows you how to bleach treat leaves and eggs in order to prevent OE spores from even being brought into your system. If you keep things sanitary enough, that greatly reduces the chance of OE parasites ever rearing their ugly head. Next. The majority of the people that I conferred with would also agree that if you're just raising a small number, say five or ten monarchs, just as a hobbyist, maybe you're just trying to teach your kids about the life cycle of butterflies, then it's not that big of a deal if you are releasing some monarchs that are OE infested. It's not going to cause huge, significant problems. After that, though, if you are rearing larger numbers of monarchs, and it's tough to really draw a line where, but let's just say, 20 or more, the more you rear, the more important it will be to be testing for OE. You definitely should take this under consideration. And it's simple to do. But now, the big question, what should you do if you test a monarch and it does have OE spores infested on it? Well, I think the most important quote in all of this comes from Dr. Sonia Altizer. There are no strict guidelines on the matter. Being a prominent expert on OE parasites, if not the expert, I think that those are words that all of us should take to heart. So understand that here in Michigan, where OE spores are not that prevalent and OE parasites don't have as strong of a foothold as in other regions, I will still be taking the advice of Monarch Watch and I will be euthanizing my adults that I find infested. Wherever you live, should you in your region choose the same as me or choose differently? I felt it was just important to make sure that this information is out there so that way, whatever choice you make, it can be a more informed one. I'm Rich Lund, and I want to thank you for checking out this video, and I especially want to thank you for doing what you can to help out the monarch butterfly. Good luck with your efforts, and I'll catch you next time.